Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Newton Historical Society. I'm Kathy Meserve, the Vice President. Uh, welcome to the beginning of our 2017 presentation series. Uh, tonight's subject is New Hampshire Covered Bridges. Our program is made possible by a grant from the New Hampshire Humanities Council. Our speaker tonight is Mr. Glenn Knobloch, who will be speaking to us. He's an independent scholar and author of 15 books and over 100 articles. He is also the author and historian on projects related to Northern New England bridges, New Hampshire cemeteries, brewing history, and African American military history. Mr. Knobloch holds a BA in history from the Bowling Green State University. Before I turn over the microphone, I have the usual housekeeping items. There are two exits to this room. First are the double doors behind you, and the other exit is behind me to the side of the stage. Uh, there are restrooms which are available behind you through the double doors. I think most of you have already received the survey that we hand out whenever we do a New Hampshire Humanities Council uh, program. If you would fill it out and at the end of the program just return it over to that table, we'd appreciate it. We also have some booklets from Newton's 250th anniversary. If you don't have one, you're welcome to take one over there. Um, and finally, we have donations. Um, we don't charge a fee for these kind of programs, but if you want to make a donation, you can. What the society does is match the donations that we receive tonight, and then we give the whole thing to the Newton Food Pantry. And we've done this for several years. Um, I think without any delay, I'll give you Mr. Knobloch. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank everyone for uh, coming here tonight, taking time out of your busy schedules to join me uh, for a talk on one of my favorite subjects. Before we get started, I just want to thank the Newton Historical Society for all there, uh, for inviting me down here uh, to uh, speak about a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And I also want to thank the New Hampshire Humanities Council who helps fund this program. If any of you haven't checked out what their offerings are online, uh, or if you don't get their brochure in the mail, please check them out. They uh, offer hundreds of programs a year, uh, presenters like me, uh, covering a wide variety of topics. And the nice thing is they are entirely uh, uh, privately funded. There's no, none of your tax dollars at work. And as a result of that, all of their programs by mandate are free and open to the public. And again, I hope you'll join uh, the Historical so Society if you're able to make uh, donations to the, uh, their cause. It'll go to the Newton Food Pantry. I think it's a worthy cause. Um, and last but not least, if you like what you see tonight, uh, you're going to fill out a survey that'll give uh, valuable feedback to the Humanities Council. We certainly appreciate that. And if you really like what you see, I'm going to give my one and only sales pitch. My book, New Hampshire Covered Bridges, for a donation of 22 bucks, it's yours. A great. Uh, gift all around. And uh, with that, uh, we'll get into our topic. So let me start out by asking, how many of you like to visit New Hampshire Covered Bridges? How many of you have, uh, so we got a pretty good crowd. Uh, how many of you have seen 10? How many have seen more than 10? Okay. Anybody seen 20? Got a couple. How about 30? Okay. 40? 36. Okay, you guys are the winners. Well, New Hampshire actually has about 60 historic covered bridges remaining. There were once about 400 in the state, so they're a valuable architectural treasure to us today, but not a lot of people understand the covered bridge and how it came to be. To us, in the modern world, they seem like quaint structures, don't they? They kind of seem like a, a barn-like structure. It really takes us back to the idyllic past when supposedly everything was easier, right? Well, that's not really true. You know, like everything else, uh, you know, in the days of old, life was hard. And actually, covered bridges were not quaint structures in their day. There were valuable links in our transportation network that helped people in New Hampshire get from here to there, which is a, sometimes a very difficult thing in our state. So um, they were valuable structures and uh, have only, you know, really in the last hundred years been replaced by the more modern, you know, iron and steel bridges that we know today. The other thing is, uh, how many of you know how the covered bridge came about? Does anybody know who invented it or where it was invented? We like to think it's a New England uh, uh, invention, so to speak. They're so quaint and we have so many of them in Vermont and New Hampshire. Uh, but really, it's only a partial New England invention. The first covered bridge was built 
down in, 18, in 1805, down in, uh, near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, across the Schuylkill River. Uh, but it was built by uh, uh, a Massachusetts architect uh, who was very proud of these great arched bridges that he built. And the bridge building company that contracted Theodore Palmer to build this bridge said, you know what, we want to protect our investment. We want to cover the bridge. Well, Palmer was kind of aghast at this. He didn't like the idea of his beautiful wooden arches being covered. But of course, the bridge company paid for the bridge and their ideals prevailed. And from there, we had our first covered bridge in America. Now, the covered bridge is not native per se to America. The covered bridge was found in Europe centuries before, but used in a much different fashion. Uh, they were built in places, uh, you know, the, the London Bridge in England. Uh, there were covered bridges built in the city of Venice in Italy. Uh, but these were vastly different structures. They actually housed marketplaces, were oftentimes in the busy of great, in the, in the center of busy cities. Uh, on the other hand, in Germany, in the Black Forest region, covered bridges or shelters, more properly called, were built that, again, offered shelter to travelers. So what we did as Americans is we took an old idea from the Europeans and kind of turned it around and made it uniquely our own. So the covered bridges that you see in America and New Hampshire today are nothing like what would be seen in Europe. We took their invention and of course we made it better. The first New Hampshire covered bridge was built in the 1820s and from there we went forward. New Hampshire was not the first state uh, first New England state to build covered bridges. Actually, Maine was the first, followed by Vermont, New Hampshire, and then Massachusetts, uh, and a few that were built in Connecticut and Rhode Island. But what's interesting about New Hampshire is despite our small size, small population, we have some of the most fantastic bridges that still exist in the state or that have existed no longer there that were really technological wonders of the time. And even today, uh, members uh, of the National Society for the Pre Preservation of Covered Bridges, they make annual trips to places like New Hampshire to see some of these unusual examples that you can't see anywhere else. So that's what I hope to impart to you tonight. For those of you, like these folks here, that are used to traveling around, I give you some added information. If I've done my job after I'm done, all you folks are going to say, I want to get out there and see what we have. This is the perfect time of year going into spring and summer where you can make some road trips and really see what New Hampshire has to offer. And with that, we'll get into the slides. And we'll uh, turn down the lights a little bit here. Everybody see okay? New Hampshire covered bridges came in many different forms. This is one of the more traditional ones, what we call the village style covered bridge. And this is a Tucker toll bridge that crosses the Connecticut River uh, between New Hampshire and Vermont. And this is actually from the Vermont side and it's got the traditional sign up top here, walk your horses. Uh, and by the way, there was a fine if you didn't do that because the, uh, the iron horseshoes uh, uh, going at a fast rate could really rip up the deck of a bridge. So that's why uh, town fathers really only wanted you to walk your horses through there. Notice it has some architectural elements that are quite appealing. It's got the curved entrance to the bridge, which we call the portal. Okay, so it's nice and curved. Notice the decorative columns here. Uh, uh, and uh, notice also the sidewalk. So that's one, these are some of the highlights of the village style covered bridge, it, typically in the center of a town uh, where they offer some of these distinct, distinguishing features. What's interesting is the added sidewalks, again, for pedestrian use. Now you'd think in our day and age, how much traffic did they possibly have that they needed uh, foot, uh, a foot bridge as well? Well, most of these bridges were built with two, each side had a bridge. And uh, most town fathers found out after a while that the maintenance required to keep those under repair uh, was not needed and they would close one side of the bridge and just keep one pedestrian walkway. This bridge was a marvel crossing the Connecticut River. It cost about $8,000 to build in the 1850s. And early on, like many of the Connecticut River bridges, it was a toll bridge. You had to pay money to cross it. These were privately owned structures uh, that were built for commercial purposes. Uh, later on, many of these bridges were what we call freed up and made free and open to the public. Some of them, though, not until as late as the 1950s. So 
uh, for, for many years, in some cases, these were toll bridges. And this was actually built by a fellow named Captain Isaac Damon from Northampton, Massachusetts, who built bridges all up and down the Connecticut River uh, in uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, as well as in Massachusetts, and also built bridges as far away as Maine. So he was a well-known covered bridge builder. This bridge went out with the advent of modern transportation in the early uh, 20th century. Here we see one of the long covered bridges, the Cornish-Windsor covered bridge that crosses between Cornish, New Hampshire and Windsor, Vermont. It is the longest covered bridge in America and it's still in use today. It was built by two men, Bela Fletcher and James Tasker. And uh, once again, it was a major engineering marvel of its day. It's over 400 feet long, three spans. And uh, notice the center pier in the river here. Have any of you been over this bridge? Fantastic, you like that bridge, I can see. You go through that bridge, it's like going through a long, dark tunnel. The windows provide some illumination, but it really is a fantastic experience. Again, originally built as a toll bridge. Uh, it was later taken over by the state during World War II. And finally, in 1952, I believe it was, it was made a free bridge. You could uh, cross it without having to pay a toll. Uh, it has been well maintained over the years until uh, Tropical Storm Irene about five years ago. It was the second longest covered bridge in America. The one that surpassed it in Blenheim, New York, actually fell down during Tropical Irene, uh, making this the, the leader. It is not the longest covered bridge in North America because up in New Brunswick and Quebec there are longer bridges, but it is certainly one with some of the most fascinating history. And some of that history involves the taking of tolls in and of themselves. For example, like today, how many of you have an Easy Pass account when you're going on the New Hampshire Turnpike and stuff? Well, what the old toll takers did, at one end of the uh, bridge, there was a, a little uh, a toll keeper's house with a gate that went up and down. The gate looked like a section of picket, picket fence, believe it or not. And local farmers that would cro cross between New Hampshire and Vermont quite regularly would keep in the record book, they would keep record of how much they owed and they'd settle up from time to time, often monthly. And you had to pay if you're taking a flock of uh, chickens across the bridge, well, you had to pay for that. And I don't know how much a chicken costs to cross a covered bridge. That's kind of like, a, you know, uh, how, why did the chicken cross the covered bridge? I don't know. <laughs> Um, you had to pay if you had a herd of cows or whatever. So that's kind of the basic things that we don't think about today as far as the tolls on it. Some of the legendary stories about the bridge are what happened when the traveling circus came to town. Uh, and it's said that the, the head uh, master of the circus would stop at the toll taker's house and dicker with the toll taker, maybe give him a few free tickets to the circus nearby. But then they had to dicker. How much does it cost for a tiger to cross a covered bridge, for example? Now, they used to make jokes about the elephant. All circuses in the old days had an elephant. An elephant would not fit through the covered bridge, actually. They had to raft him across separately. So uh, some of those interesting details that are lost to us today. Here's the uh, uh, interior of a neighboring covered bridge. Now, covering bridges, what holds them up? Well, it's the truss or the the part of the bridge that you don't see unless you go inside. And they came in many different forms. And New Hampshire early on was known for developing these various truss forms. And a truss is very simply, is a built panel, okay? If you think of a tic-tac-toe box with an X in the middle, that's a truss panel. And if you think of a series of those, that's what makes up the strength of the bridge, okay? In this case, we see what we call the town lattice truss, which was the most common of the uh, uh, bridge uh, trusses that were used back then. It was developed by a man named Ithiel Town from New Haven, Connecticut, who was a trained architect. And he built a few bridges on his own, but basically he made most of his money by selling his truss designs to various uh, towns. And you had to pay a dollar a foot. If you were a town and you wanted to build a bridge using this style of truss, you had to pay a dollar a foot. And uh, uh, Ithiel Town had agents that scoured throughout New England looking for bridges that may have been built without his authorization or more importantly, without him being paid. The Town Lattice Trust is very simple. If we think of a bit of garden lattice today, notice that each juncture point is pinned together. In this case, it's held together by what we call tree nails or trunnels. Let's talk about pounding a, a round peg into a square hole. That's basically what it is. This allows the connection to be firm, secure, but yet it offers a degree of flexibility. 
And as uh, many of you may know, wood uh, expands and contracts with the season. So it was natural material to use to allow a bridge to expand and contract and not become damaged uh, with the seasonal weather changes. It's such a simple idea. It's actually one of the, one of the greatest inventions uh, you know, in our modern history. We don't even think about it today. Uh, and uh, offered a very strong connection. So I always urge people when you visit these bridges, look inside them too. Don't just look at the pretty outside. Take a look at the structure and how they're held together and you'll really be amazed at our old time craftsmen. Anybody back in those days that could build a barn, which also used a lot of the, the peg type construction, could build some of these types of structures. But what made them more difficult to build is when you're crossing a river like the Connecticut River, you know, hundreds of feet long, that takes uh, pure engineering skill. We showed you the longest covered bridge in New Hampshire. We're going to show you the shortest. By the way, I got to go back. I'm going to go back one here, uh, a couple. Uh, we call this a New Hampshire covered bridge. It connects New Hampshire and Vermont, right? Most of you uh, may not be aware that New Hampshire owns the Connecticut River right up to the high water mark on the Vermont side. In actuality, the two states and towns do share some of the maintenance, but New Hampshire by and large, because of that ownership of the Connecticut River, pays about 90% of any bridge related uh, repairs and maintenance and stuff like that. So that's why we call any bridge that spans between New Hampshire and Vermont over the Connecticut River, it's a New Hampshire bridge. Anybody from Vermont? Okay, good, we're okay. We see the smallest one here. This is over in Langdon, New Hampshire, the uh, Drewsville or Prentice Bridge is sometimes called. It's only 36 feet long. And we look at that and we say, that's ridiculous. Why do we need a 36 foot long bridge? I could practically jump across there, right? Except do we all know about spring runoff in New Hampshire? This was photographed in the fall when the stream was low. But if you picture it now, this time of year, when the stream is high, well, that's what you get. So even the smallest bridges can be very important. And this was actually on a road called the Chester Turnpike heading north uh, into New Hampshire and the western part of the state. It was, a, a, once again, not a heavily traveled road today, but back in its day, it was a vital link. When this bridge was out, farmers would have to make a 9 to 12 mile detour. That's losing a whole day of travel. For us, 9 to 12, detour, 9 to 12 mile detour today is nothing. It's an inconvenience. For a farmer or someone trying to get from here to there, it was losing a day's worth of travel and all that headache it, that in, in, ensued. Uh, so this bridge uh, is one of the smallest in the country as well. It is not the smallest. The state of Ohio a few years ago built a covered bridge that was 18 foot long. However, you know why they built that? They built that to say they have the smallest covered bridge. <laughs> we built this in New Hampshire because we need that bridge. So that's the difference. And here you see uh, the, uh, the oldest covered bridge in New Hampshire. This is an older view of the bridge. It has since been repaired. But the Haverhill Bath uh, covered bridge built in 1827 up in, Vermont, up in uh, the North Country there on the Amanusik River. And this is an example of a village style covered bridge, but in a more, much more rusticated fashion. The North Country bridges in particular were very barn-like in appearance, often painted red with white trim. Notice how the entry, the portal of the covered bridge really almost looks like a barn entryway. But notice it does have its added sidewalk here. This bridge took th almost three years to build and cost somewhere in the neighborhood of about $3,000 in 1827 with a change of architects in between. So it was really a very complex structure and uh, once again, it has been repaired since this photo was taken. So it looks even better today, um, it also served up until about 2005 as a major thoroughfare in town where local fire and emergency vehicles had to use this bridge. Since 2005 flooding that occurred up in that area, they have since built a concrete bridge next to it. So even though this bridge is still open to travel, it's not nearly as heavily traveled as it once was. So this is a bridge that remained as a major artery or a major piece of our transportation artery from 1827 to 2005. That's a long time. And here we see another village style covered bridge. And in my 
humble opinion, probably the most beautiful in all of New England, if not of all the covered bridges. The uh, Thompson Bridge uh, down in Swansea, uh, built in 1832 by a fellow named Zadok Taft for $532, uh, which seems like a pretty good deal today. That was a fair amount of money back then. Notices of the town lattice construction, so you can see that lattice truss inside there. But notice it's got the beautiful curved portal there. Notice we've got the one sidewalk on the one side, again, with its own curved portal. The other sidewalk is closed, but it used to have one. And the town of Swansea, again, is distinctively known for uh, deep, rich red color uh, covered bridges uh, with the white trim. Uh, so they're very beautiful bridges. Um, you'll notice a few concessions to modern problems, if you will. Notice the fire alarm. And right here, the fire hydrant. It's crossing water. There's water right there. Um, the fact of the matter is Swansea lost one of its historic bridges to arson uh, back in the late 1990s. Uh, so they've had to put up fire alarms on their bridges and things like that. By the way, Swansea is a great place to go if you're looking for a nice area to visit where you can see numerous covered bridges, the Route 10 corridor down there. If you haven't been down there, look it up in the map. Make a day of it from Newton. Very easy to do. Yes, ma'am. Metal roofs were put on, again, just for uh, long lastingness. So a lot, of, a lot of these bridges have been upgraded uh, kind of to withstand today, today's elements. In the olden times, the old wooden uh, shingle roofs had to replay, be replaced periodically. So this just helps with modern maintenance. And here we'll see a bridge from the North Country up in Sandwich, New Hampshire, the Durgeon Covered Bridge. It's one of my favorite uh, bridges. It's in my home area. Even though I always get lost trying to find it, it's in a rather remote location. Uh, and it is, was built in the 1860s by a fellow named Jacob Berry uh, from Conway, New Hampshire, who was a rather well-known local builder that built some of the other covered bridges in Conway. And uh, he used a very unusual truss that really is native to New Hampshire. And it's called the uh, Paddleford Truss. What they did was they took a unique truss with these boxed X's. Notice these boxed X designs. So again, my tic-tac-toe panels here. But what he did was two things. One, he added an arch to it. Now the arch runs from embankment to embankment. So it's again, it provides added structure. But he also took the X's in these boxes. It's kind of hard to see. And each X extends into the next box ever so slightly. This was done by a fellow named Peter Paddleford. Say that name three times, Peter Paddleford, Peter Paddleford. I can't do it. Peter Paddleford of Littleton, New Hampshire. He did not patent his truss, and it's a derivation of some of the other trusses, uh, but it became very popular in northern New Hampshire and western Maine, right along the New Hampshire border. Uh, there is only one other type with what we call the Paddleford truss built in all of the country, and that was one that was built in Ohio, southern Ohio. So it's a very rare bridge form. So if you like to visit these bridges and see the architectural details, these are the bridges to look for. And uh, uh, what I like about this bridge is it's never, uh, it has its original truss members. Now, and that's what makes a historic covered bridge. Notice the white roof there, that's fiberglass. It's got new roof timbers, so the roof has been replaced. By the way, the decking on a covered bridge especially back in the day, was replaced every couple years. So what makes a historic covered bridge historic are these original truss timbers and the arches if there's one present. Although these arches, in many cases, town fathers, and we're not talking about trained engineers, but town people had an idea. Some people thought the arches added weight was, was uh, not beneficial to the bridge and would remove the arches. And along a few years later, another town father might say, no, we need those arches to keep the bridge strong. There was never uh, agreement in all cases. Um, but these are the original trusses from the 1860s. And I'll compare that to the ship down in Boston Harbor, the USS Constitution. You know, it's been around for a long time, but you know, the siding of the ship has been changed. You know, it's been hit by cannonballs and things. The masts and the sails have changed over years. But what hasn't changed on the Constitution is the backbone of the ship, the keel of the ship. Well, that's what a truss is. It's the backbone of the bridge that really is the essential and defining feature of a covered bridge. So uh, uh, when this boat builder 
boasted when this bridge was completed back in the 1860s that it could hold, be filled entirely with cordwood and not sink under its weight. We don't know if he's right or not. They never tried it, but uh, his bridges uh, withstood the elements for uh, you know, well over 140 years now. By the way, that's my son many years ago uh, playing on the trusses just to give us an idea of how massive these laminated trusses are, about 13 or 14 layers thick. And here we see another example of the Paddleford Truss with arch design up in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire. Pittsburgh, way at the northern uh, uh, north, uh, west part of the state, is a fantastic place to visit, a very remote, so if you like camping, hunting, fishing, that's a place to go. But again, these small bridges up here, I believe this is a Happy Corner Bridge, I can't remember for sure, but uh, very small bridges, roughly 60 to 80 feet in length. Notice it has one underpinning support here, almost looks like a sawhorse type support, so even those are wood. But notice the Paddleford truss, the off-kilter X boxes with the added arch. And three of those bridges remain up in Pittsburgh today. All of them are what we call bypassed or closed. They're not open to uh, road traffic today. But nonetheless, they're again an important grouping of bridges in a rural area that really kind of brings back uh, 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 to us what life was like back then. Any of you seen this bridge before? It's perhaps the most uh, famous of our covered bridges in New Hampshire, the Honeymoon Bridge up in Jackson, New Hampshire, uh, uh, built by two brothers, Charles and uh, Frank Stoughton, uh, I'm sorry, Broughton. And uh, the Broughtons were interesting builders because like many men of their day, they didn't just build covered bridges, although they built three or four covered bridges in their years up in the Conway Jackson area, that North Country area. They were also known as fiddle players at local harvest festivals and other merrymaking times. They are also noted bear hunters, a lot of bears up there. So, uh, but they were really good at building covered bridges at last. And this bridge, once again, has one sidewalk on the side. So it's, again, typical of the North Country bridges. It doesn't have a lot of architectural features where we talk about uh, you know, columns or anything like that. It has, in this case, as the barn overhang for the portal. But it does have that covered sidewalk, and again, in a little town setting. If any of you have been to Jackson, you kind of know what that little town is like. Uh, so it's a very lovely place to visit. And certainly the most photographed bridge in all of New Hampshire and appears pretty much every year on, on any calendar that has to do with some sort of calendar that has to do with New Hampshire or New England. Very, very popular bridge. And here we see uh, up here the whitewash covered bridge, Stark covered bridge up in Stark, New Hampshire. And again, another village style covered bridge. It's beautiful in its simplicity. Most of the bridges in that area, Stark, uh, Northumberland, places like that, were whitewashed. And that's very simple, it makes sense. Uh, this one, uh, dirt certain courses, uh, times of the year, decorated with flags, gives it a beautiful presentation. And again, notice it has its double sidewalks intact. It's a rare structure in New Hampshire. And again, just a beautiful example. It is still used by local traffic today, but to be frank, there's not a lot of traffic up in Stark other than, you know, the town is very small. And of course, uh, in the summer, there's a lot of tourists that go up there. Believe it or not, about 20 years ago, the town of Stark themselves was debating having this covered bridge removed. And I think whatever town father suggested that uh, uh, was promptly uh, shot down, so to speak, because uh, uh, that is a major tourist attraction up there. And it's such a beautiful structure, built again in the uh, late 1850s, we think by a man named Captain Charles Richardson. So well worth a visit up there in Stark. And here we see the longest covered bridge up in Bath remaining in New Hampshire. Now you're gonna say, well, wait a minute, Glenn, you were talking about that other covered bridge between Cornish and Windsor. Well, that does end on the Vermont side, so Vermont owns a tiny part of that bridge. Uh, this bridge is entirely within Coas County in New Hampshire, and it's over uh, 370 feet long, I believe. Uh, but it's a really unusual structure built back in the 1840s. Has a modern tin roof on it or metal roof on it today. Uh, but what's fascinating about this, two things. One, it's one of the few bridges known in town uh, in any New Hampshire town to have a caretaker. And this caretaker, his job was to sweep it every 30 days. I could never get my kid to sweep the garage, let alone uh, trying to sweep a covered bridge. That's a big job. 
And usually it went to a retired fellow in, his, in town in his 70s or 80s that had to do that. So that was a big job. Uh, the other thing you'll notice about it is notice all the peer center port supports under there. Those are a later addition. When this bridge was first built, there was one center support, but then the railroad came to town and they had to find a place for the railroad. So what they did is they jacked up the bridge and the railroad ran under the bridge. When the Boston and Maine left town and their tracks were no needed, no longer needed, the bridge was brought back down and settled right on those, uh, on those piers and it has given the bridge added support. So this is the longest covered bridge entirely within the state of New Hampshire. And again, that Bath area, you want to take a trip, a little bit more of a commitment going farther north there, but there's uh, three, uh, three covered bridges right in the Bath area that are well worth visiting uh, just for their size and their age. I kind of like this bridge. I think we're a little out of focus on that picture. That's better. Um, this is the Carlton covered bridge in Swansea. Remember I told you Swansea has a good group of covered bridges. And this is what happens when a br covered bridge is neglected and goes toward decay. Notice the open siding here, lets in water. That's always bad for a bridge truss. That'll lead to a bridge falling down within five years or less in New England and New Hampshire weather. Notice there were two windows, they're right here still, but this is open to the elements. You can also, if you were to go inside, the old metal roof, the old tin roof, which was probably put on uh, in the early 1900s, has many holes in it, lets in water. Again, the death knell of a covered bridges. But if uh, attention is paid to them, they can be saved. And here's what that bridge looks like today. That's the same bridge uh, after it was restored. What's fascinating about this bridge is uh, it, there has been a bridge at this location since the 1760s. We don't know when the first covered bridge was built here. Uh, this Carlton Bridge dates at least from the uh, uh, 1850s, as far as we know. It's possible a covered bridge was on this site even earlier, but there's no documentary evidence for it. And this truss that it uses is a very simple, what we call a Queen's Post truss, so if you think of a Simple, uh, uh, simple deal like that, like many folks might use in their driveway to cover a small uh, stream or something if they have to go uh, travel over that. It's very simple truss, uh, one being used for thousands of years. And uh, notice it has a slight camber to it as it crosses the river, a little slight arch design. Uh, part of that uh, caused by the approaches that lead to it. Uh, so it's a beautiful bridge down there. And uh, again, it's possibly uh, the first covered bridge may have been built even before that time. And he, once again, notice his barn-like appearance, uh, very typical of the kind of the rural style covered bridges as opposed to the village style. Uh, simple, uh, simple portal without any architectural adornments. The portals were sized approximately 13, 12, 13 feet in height. And that was said to accommodate a standard wagon load of hay uh, in a rural region. So if you can imagine a horse-drawn wagon loaded with hay, it can get through that covered bridge. That would be the tallest thing going through it. So uh, once again, Swansea, great place to see some bridges. Up in my neck of the woods, this shows a bridge also in decay. And this is a better view than what it looks like today, the Whittier covered bridge across the Bear Camp River in Ossipee. And again, this is that, uh, that truss that I was talking about, the uh, Paddleford Truss. Notice how this bridge is in decline. The, the siding is gone. Now, you'll notice that half of the bridge doesn't have siding. Covered bridges throughout New Hampshire, no one truly agreed on whether a bridge should be built and sided all the way up, as many towns did. Some folks thought that it only needed to be sided halfway up, that that would offer enough protection from the elements. And uh, some people left a strip toward the eaves to allow the structure to breathe and not be fully enclosed. So there was no one standard design for these. Uh, sadly, this bridge was neglected by the town of Ossipee, so much so that it had to be removed. Now sits on the river bank today where it has sat for the last about six or seven years. And it's slowly falling apart. We fear that we're gonna lose this bridge, but there are uh, constant efforts to push. Uh, no one has the money to pay for it. By the way, the way that works is the state will pay the bulk of the money, but the town also has to contribute. 
And, you know, in our recent economic climates, towns haven't always had the money to pay for these structures, and that is the case up in Ossipee. So this bridge, if you go up to Ossipee, you cannot see it today other than it's sitting on the side of the river bank off its original perch. And, you know, we see bridges uh, in New Hampshire, especially our bigger rivers, like the Connecticut River, in a wide variety of configurations. Uh, this is uh, at Hinsdale, New Hampshire, on the lower Connecticut River, right near the point where it uh, hits Massachusetts. And uh, this shows the flooding that took place in the early 1900s, before 1907. This was approximately 1903 when this picture was taken. And this is actually Barrett's Island in the center of the Connecticut River. And the way this worked was we had one covered bridge, short covered bridge from New Hampshire going to Barrett's Island, which is totally inundated here. And then we had a longer covered bridge going from Barrett's Island to the Vermont shore. Moments after this picture was taken, this bridge was swept away and rode like Noah's Ark down the Connecticut River until it crashed into the riverbank. Luckily, they were able to save the structure. It was hauled back into place by many teams of oxen, so it was brought back. But this taught the state of New Hampshire a lesson, and by 1907, these bridges were removed. They knew that they had to build bridges higher above the Connecticut River so that things like this couldn't happen. You guys have all heard that phrase, the 100-year flood, and then we've heard about the 100-year flood the next year and then two years later. Uh, so there's no such thing as a 100-year flood anymore, really. So this was an eye-opener for the state of New Hampshire, really. And uh, they wouldn't fully get that uh, message until the early 1940s, the uh, famed uh, 1938 hurricane that really brought on a lot of destruction and caused a lot of flooding, finally changed a lot of minds, especially on New Hampshire's larger rivers, the Merrimack and the Connecticut. Here we see the most complicated bridge ever built across the Merrimack River up at Boscawin, New Hampshire, just near Concord. It was built in 1857 by a railroad, uh, uh, a firm that uh, specialized in uh, railroad bridges, the, Ch Henniker, uh, the Childs Brothers out of Henniker, New Hampshire. And it was based on a very unusual bridge truss designed by a railroad engineer named Daniel McCallum. He was an Army Corps of Engineer guy who never stepped foot in New Hampshire, but his design did. And it was a very complex truss with many different uh, parts to it, probably unnecessarily complicated, but because of the way that truss was designed, it gave this bridge an old world look to it, uh, and because of its arched look to it, they called it the Rainbow Bridge. Rainbow Bridge actually lasted for 50 years uh, until 1907 flooding, which was a, a great time of flooding on the Connecticut uh, and uh, Merrimack Rivers, brought this bridge down and turned it into matchsticks. But um, it has, it's one of those bridges that really had that old world appeal to it. It's the way it was shingled, the way uh, the truss was built, and the way it was covered. It really reminded many people of an old country uh, covered bridge uh, plopped down in the middle of New Hampshire. And here we see another unusual type of bridge. Uh, there are no types of this bridge anymore. This is what we call a double barreled covered bridge. Now there are two types of double barreled covered bridge and by what we mean are two lanes, one for each side. You have a true double barreled covered bridge that has a truss on this side, a truss on this side, but a third truss for added support that goes right down the center, okay? A, uh, if you want to call it a faux double-barreled bridge, just has a wall down the center to, to, to make it a two-lane bridge, but that center support is not giving it really any extra support. Now this is across the Sauhegan River in Milford, New Hampshire. This picture was taken in the late 1930s. I like it for two, two reasons. One, it's one of the last photographs taken of the bridge. And you think, why in little Milford, New Hampshire, would they need, did they have that much traffic? Did they need that? Well, they actually did. That was a big stone quarrying area. So they were carrying heavy cartloads of stone and crushed rock across this bridge. So it needed to be very strong. So thus, the, uh, the double-barreled covered bridge. The other thing I like about it is it really shows in the village covered bridges, especially the communal nature of these structures. Notice all these postings on here. Uh, you know, these would be for local wares for sale, snake oil medicines, a circus coming to town, garage sales, who knows, whatever you can think of, that's what's posted on these. 
And it's really said in about any New Hampshire covered bridge up until the 1940s, you would see remnants of these posters. It's not until the 40s when the antique craze really came along that you know, uh, people started traveling and seeing these pieces of paper as really antiques in and of themselves and something worthy of sale that they were taken down. But if you look in some of the older bridges, every once in a while you look up in these areas here and you can see remnants of nails just randomly pounded in there for apparently for no reason, but this is the real reason. So these structures were also a sort of community bulletin board, if you will. This bridge was taken down uh, by design in the late 1930s and again replaced by a concrete bridge that is still there today. Again, so just so the town doesn't have to maintain the covered portion of it. And here we see one of the most uh, unusual covered bridges built not just in New Hampshire, but all of New England. It's the Republican covered bridge in Franklin. It is no longer there. It was built in the 1860s by a builder named Boston John Clark up in Franklin. Well-known railroad bridge builder uh, called Boston because he built for the Boston and Maine Railroad. And what's unusual about it is its hipped roof design. Only one of two bridges of this type were built in all of New England, the other one at Norwich Walk, Maine. So it's got an unusual bridge structure to it. It was built as a toll bridge until it was, again, deliberately taken down by the town in the 1930s. Uh, again, this was an old bridge at the time. They didn't want to repair it. They didn't see any tourist value in it. I guarantee you they're regretting that decision today. But you know that uh, you know hindsight is 2020, and so they took it down. By the way, it's called Republican Covered Bridge because it was named after the Republic of America, not for any political party. And you know we haven't talked about any uh, New Hampshire Seacoast area covered bridges because really there was only one. This area of New Hampshire, and you go further, <coughs> further east toward Exeter and Portsmouth and places like that. The rivers are tidal in nature; they ebb and flow. There's no need for uh, you know, complex covered bridges. Simple pile and beam bridges would do. So, and the rivers themselves, uh, the Winnicott, the, uh, and s some of these other smaller rivers, the Squamscott, are not, lar la are not wide rivers. So covered bridges were not appropriate in the seacoast. But they built one, and this is across Great Bay between Newington and um, uh, Durham. Uh, or I'm sorry, Dover Point. So if you know where they're building, doing all the bridge construction today, that's where this bridge stood. And it stood just not far from the Newington side of the shore. Look at the wrecked schooner on the shore here, right next to a covered bridge. That's two, two uh, things from our old time past, if you will. They built a double barreled covered bridge. It was intended originally for the Portsmouth Railroad. Uh, so it had two different rail lines going through it. Eventually they converted it one rail line and one, uh, one pedestrian and later automobile traffic. So very unusual and a, uh, a support uh, separating the two. This bridge, by the way, is deceptive. It looks small. It was over 300 feet long. And it's a combination covered bridge. You had the beam and pile and beam bridge. You had the covered bridge. In the middle of Great Bay, you had a swing bridge. It would open up to let ship traffic through and stuff. It's probably the most unusual covered bridge ever built in the country, or one of the most unusual in, in its setting, if you will. So it's almost very close to being an ocean setting. Not quite, but very close. Not far from the mouth of the Piscataway River. And this bridge lasted until the 1930s, when the General Sullivan Bridge that is still there today, crossing, uh, was built to replace it. So uh, unusual structure. And there is a toll bridge for that structure. You know how busy that area is today? Can you imagine it being kind of this bucolic? Uh, it's just hard to imagine, but there's a toll taker's house there. You had to stop and, again, pay the toll. There's an automobile going through there, an old postcard view. So uh, reminds us of what travel once used to be like. The other uh, covered bridges that you could see in this area was this bridge in Newmarket, New Hampshire, across the Lamprey River. And this is a yet another type of covered bridge it was once common in New Hampshire. Uh, with the loss of this bridge in 2005, there are no more remaining. These are what we call the factory covered bridge. Remember, all the mills in New Hampshire, anywhere there's water, bodies of running water, there were mill complexes. And these mill complexes were built on both sides of the river. 
So they had to have bridges, and they were almost always covered to allow workers and the materials that were used in the mills to pass back and forth between various parts of the factory. Okay? In this case, it has a town lattice truss that only goes halfway up. All the remaining covered bridges in New Hampshire, including this one, are I visited. This is the only one I couldn't cross on foot. I was too chicken to do it because you can see all the holes there. It was deemed unsafe. They were actually converting the uh, mill place there to apartments at the time, and the bridge was closed, but a worker let me in without authorization. And he said, you can walk across if you want. I'm not going to do it. And I, I got about 10 steps in there, and I said, you know what? I'm not going to either. I'll just have to confess I'm not going to do it. And with good reason, a few years later, this was washed away and is no more. It actually, the mill owners, when they bought it, uh, they fought with the town. The town wanted them to preserve this covered bridge and use it as part of the revamped structure. They didn't want to do that. You know what? They won in the end because they waited long enough where it fell down on its own. But it's a shame because it was the last of that type of covered bridge left in, in, in New Hampshire. We see bridges in different combinations up in Penacook, New Hampshire, across the Merrimack at a difficult bend in the river. You had the twin bridges. And originally, they were two covered bridges. There's a small island in the center, but there's just enough of a difficult bend there that you couldn't have one contiguous bridge. So they built two, and they just called them the twins. The first twin, very early on, was struck by lightning and destroyed, and so they replaced it with an iron bridge. And that bridge lasted, uh, that bridge, covered bridge, lasted into the 1950s until it too was struck by lightning and burned and also replaced by an iron bridge. So the twins up there, we often, is what we call them. Here's another type, the uh, railroad covered bridges, okay? Now, remember I was, we were talking about covered bridges. What it really means to cover a bridge is to cover its truss. We don't care about the pedestrians or the railroad traffic. It's that the trusses themselves are covered and protected from the elements. And this bridge is an example of it. As far as we know, the last uh, of the uh, pedestrian railroad bridges. So this is the Boston Main Railroad in Rollinsford, New Hampshire. This is a little farm lane up here that a farmer had to have access from one side of his fields to the other that were split by the railroad. And so the Boston and Maine in the early 1900s built this bridge for him. Notice how it was boxed in or covered bridge. Its trusses were covered. I don't know if that bridge is still there today. I vi last visited it about seven years ago. Um, my guess is that it's probably not there anymore. But uh, so big or small, the idea of these covered bridges, the tr truss part that's covered, they were very important, even to the local farmer. Uh, and it made this bridge last about 100 years, which is uh, pretty amazing when all that is is a wooden structure. You can see it's in a bad, pretty bad shape there. Railroad bridges, though, people don't often think about those, but today people also come to New Hampshire because we have more railroad bridges in the country than anybody, and that's not hard to do because uh, there's only other, one other railroad bridge in the country outside of New Hampshire, and that's in Vermont. New Hampshire has, I can't remember, five or six left. These were once quite common all across America, just like pedestrian and uh, you know, horse uh, used covered bridges. Railroads, too, resorted to covered bridges. Now, it's kind, of, it's kind of strange to think about because when you think about the cinders and all the smoke coming out of these locomotives, you think a covered bridge would not really be appropriate, but they were actually used. Some of them had different uh, various forms of ventilation along the top of the roof line to allow for them. This is the most complex railroad bridge ever built in New Hampshire. Crosses the Merrimack River uh, between Bedford and Manchester. And uh, it is, uses a lattice uh, truss that is three layers thick. And it's a major engineering project. What I like about this is it's probably one of the first covered bridges photographed in its construction. That's the photographer's tent right there. So these, these pictures, uh, this is real time pictures when this was built uh, in the late 1850s. And here's the portal of that bridge. So it's a beautiful railroad bridge. Notice it's a dual uh, double barreled covered bridge, but not a true because there's no truss down the center. They didn't need that because each truss on either side was three layers thick. 
So that's important. And notice the beautiful columns here, the dental work on the trim here and stuff. It really was a beautiful bridge. What's interesting though, these signs are telling passengers they got off on this side of the river, then they had to walk across the bridge to get to the station house on the other side. And they used to have to tell the ladies, lift up your skirts so they don't get singed by the cinders that are in the railroad bread and in the surrounding area. So it's an unusual setup and nobody's ever been able to tell me why they didn't have the station on the other side. But uh, my guess is that had to do with the dispute between whether the station was in Bedford or Manchester. So. This is a railroad bridge, one of two left on the Sugar River down near Warner, New Hampshire. And remember we talked about the portal of a standard covered bridge, about 12 feet high. This is over 20 feet high. I believe this is 23 feet high. Again, enough room to accommodate a locomotive. These structures were built in the late, uh, from the 1850s uh, into the early 1900s in New Hampshire. These structures were built in the 1890s. Um, ironically enough, they weren't built using New Hampshire timber, but Georgia Southern Pine. You say, why, why, why is the Boston and Maine doing that? Well, uh, they could afford to ship that up. It was actually cheaper for them to do it at the time. And of course, they controlled the railroad and the branches. <coughs> so they shipped the timber to the site and built it. Why were they still building covered bridges in the 1890s? What about iron bridges and steel bridges? Well, covered wooden bridges were cheaper. It was a known technology, so why not build it? You go, they're trying to make money. They're doing it uh, the cheapest and yet most effective way they know how, and these covered bridges are still standing today. Of course, they see no railroad traffic. Railroad traffic is long gone, but they are on beautiful hiking trails, so if you're adventurous and you want to hit uh, Warner and down that way, they're really an impressive sight. They don't have much architectural elements to them. They're not... Uh, pretty in the traditional sense, but they're pretty impressive in their size. And here we see yet another type of railroad covered bridge. This is in Greenville, New Hampshire, not New York as the postcard says, but the statistics are right, 105 feet high, high off the ground, 626 feet long, the longest railroad bridge in the state and one of the longest ever built in the country. And what's interesting, this is a covered bridge, right? We call this type of bridge the upside down covered bridge because the bridge trusses themselves are covered. Think of that covered railroad bridge box and the train is running on top of it. Remember, we're not trying to protect the people or the train, we're trying to protect the truss and the structure itself to make it last and be able to serve. Sadly, this bridge did not last long. It was arsoned in 1905, burned to the ground and never rebuilt. But this, once again, was major engineering feat just to build these center piers alone 105 feet tall. It was a, a quite, a, quite an accomplishment. Well, we had similar bridges like this elsewhere in New Hampshire. The High Bridge in Claremont, New Hampshire was another example. That was later replaced by an iron bridge. And you can still see that today, but when you go under that bridge, you get an idea uh, how tall these structures were built off the ground. And of course, we already talked about the Twin bridges up in, up in uh, um, Penacook, Hookset had the triplets. And we've got three railroad covered bridges built in succession, again at a bend in the river in Hookset, New Hampshire. Each of these bridges were th uh, a little over 270 feet long. In between, they were separated by little iron bridges. And once again, a known technology, the cheapest solution, yet most effective solution. The first twin triplets were built in the 1850s. They were succumbed to flooding within five or seven years. The replacements were built in the early 1860s and they lasted until the 1930s floods knocked them out. And if you go down to that spot in the Merrimack River today, at least as of a few years ago, the abutments the, for these bridges were still in place there. They were massive structures. And uh, um, I can remember talking to a fellow down in the Hooks at Manchester area who could remember these bridges as a kid. He loved to go and play on them. Of course, he'd get beat by his parents when he came back home because he wasn't supposed to be playing on the railroad tracks, but pretty impressive structures. You know, eventually, by the early 20th century, covered bridges were a thing of the past. Um, iron bridges came along by the 1870s, not long after steel bridges came along, but still they were being built. The last covered bridge built in New Hampshire for purely 
commercial reasons was about 1912 up in Columbia crossing the Connecticut River. Now there were later covered bridges that were built. Uh, Hancock Greenfield built a covered bridge in 1932, but they wanted it for tourist reasons. They could have built any kind of bridge, but they said for tourist reasons, we want a, uh, we want a covered bridge. Their covered bridge is considered historic today. It has over three tons of metal in it though. So it's really is a composite structure, wooden on the outside with mostly metal truss. Uh, so by 1912, the era of covered bridges in New Hampshire ended. And I like this picture really because it shows the past, present, and the future. And sadly, in this case, the covered bridge up in Conway, uh, 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 Cathedral Ledge, I believe, with the uh, Mountaineer train passing through it. This is the past, okay? The present, by the way, is the Mountaineer train, okay? And the future is this little plane flying above here. We all love plane travel, don't we? Yeah, maybe it was easier in the old days, I don't know. And then I like this little guy with a hat here waving as the train goes by. So uh, anyway, this kind of uh, just kind of shows you the different modes of transportation all in one view. Uh, this bridge, by the way, lasted until the 1950s, long after the railroad went out. Its nickname was Old Sturdy. Okay, they're not going to get any points for originality, but it was a sturdy bridge. It was a town lattice bridge, and when they came to decide to take it down, they had two ways they could do it. They could do it Dynamite would be the quicker way, uh, or, uh, but you know, dynamite costs money. We could just send workmen in and they could tap out those tree nails or trunnels and the bridge would accordion on itself and fall down. And that's what they planned to do. How many of you think that worked? Anybody? It didn't work. They tried to pound out the tree nails. They couldn't do it. They eventually had to use dynamite and help saw it down. It took months to take this bridge down. Sadly, it was a relic of the past. They didn't need it. There was nothing wrong with it structurally. So uh, when we say these were built to last, they really were. And finally, uh, one of our later survivors, the Bennington uh, Covered Railroad Bridge down in Bennington, New Hampshire, crossing a small river down there. I don't even remember the name, but this photograph is not mine. It is a iconic railroad photograph. Uh, it has appeared in many books, this uh, version of a this old style locomotive chugging through this old fashioned New England covered bridge is, is uh, really one of the most famous photographs you'll find. The Bennington R Railroad Bridge lasted until 1967. It was done in not by one of these, but by a diesel locomotive that went through. In the old days, after this type of train went through, you'd have a watchman get off. He would scour the bridge with a bucket of water, putting out any of the embers and coals, and then the train would move on. Well, in the modern day, they didn't have steam locomotives. They had diesel locomotives, okay? So no sparks, no, uh, no, no cinders, nothing like that. Unfortunately, you do have metal wheels hitting metal rails. And this bridge by 1967 was a very dry structure. And that's all it took one fall day for the sparks from the wheels of the railroad that somehow got on the bridge tenders. And it was such an isolated location that it really burned down with within a very short amount of time and it was gone. So uh, that is the nature of some bridges. Some bridges are lost to natural causes, some just due to operational causes. And finally, some are lost to arson. And this is the Gothstown Railroad Bridge, uh, 1976, shows it on fire, deliberately set. Uh, New Hampshire went through a spate of those in, uh, from the 70s until the 90s. Uh, uh, Dover, one, Dover, New Hampshire's remaining covered bridge was burned down during that time. Swansea lost a covered bridge. Newport, New Hampshire lost a covered bridge. And I'm sure I'm missing two others and I can't remember them, but uh, this bridge, bridge burned for several days until it actually collapsed. And again, they never did catch the perpetrators, so uh, such is the nature of these structures. Uh, but it's still an impressive sight. You can see the town lattice through the fire there. This is a rather famous picture also of this structure at the time. Um, as we uh, talk, New Hampshire has about 60 historic covered bridges remaining today. Um, by the 1970s, New Hampshire finally determined that these are structures that we want to save. Up in between the 1920s and the 1970s, many covered bridges were taken down by individual towns. They were seen as eyesores, nuisances. We want the new iron or steel bridges that supposedly cost less to maintain. 
We now know with the effects of lead paint and stuff like that, that was not true, but um, it, uh, properly maintained, uh, uh, these bridges could have lasted longer. Of course, many of them were not in areas that could stand modern modes of transportation, big fuel delivery trucks and uh, you know, semis and things like that. So some of them had to be retired. But finally, by the 1970s, the New Hampshire Department of Transportation realized, hey, we got to save some of these structures. And that's what they've done since then. And New Hampshire Department of Transportation is actually recognized nationwide as an expert in covered bridge maintenance and repair. To this day, many other states come to our state engineers seeking advice and expertise in how to preserve their covered bridges. So that's yet, yet another way the small state of New Hampshire contributes to saving these architectural treasures that we have. So with that, I hope that I have inspired you to get out and see what New Hampshire has left for covered bridges. And uh, I'll open it up to questions if anybody has any. Anybody have any questions? Yes, ma'am. There is a list. You can actually go online. The uh, New Hampshire Department of Transportation actually has a list online of the current covered bridges. I should say that uh, when I say 60 historic covered bridges, there's probably closer to 100 covered bridges. If we think of rec replica covered bridges that many towns have built over the last 10 years, some of them what we call recreational covered bridges that you can find on local golf courses and things like that. So, uh, but if we look at the truly historic structures, and I think that number is about 60. So, uh, but go online to the state the DOT website, they'll have a listing. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, if you go to the uh, tourist information, they have the map of uh, New Hampshire, and they have a list of all of the waterfalls, and then underneath it, they have all of the uh, bridges. And on the map, they have the little covered bridges all over the list. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, the, the state wants people to come and visit them, and they, they make it very easy, and you can, uh, you know, there's a lot of material online and uh, uh, s several books that are, that are published on it as well. My book is the only one that covers past and present and kind of shows you what's there today and what was there um, yes yesteryear, so to speak. So, any other questions? Well, yes, sir? That was the towns that were doing those. We didn't have a state uh, highway department until roughly 1915 or whatever. And even then, they were looking at the uh, bigger process of building roads. So most covered bridges really, up until the 1950s, were really town-owned and maintained. After the 1950s, as, a town, as a, uh, the, the state uh, had to inter, you know, get more involved in, you know, as bridge building became more complicated and more expensive and stuff like that. And it, what's interesting is this was, these were all decisions made by town selectmen. Uh, who had no architectural experience. Uh, uh, now, some of these towns may have had engineers or uh, you know, living in town that would offer input, but most of these decisions were made by laymen who, who had no architectural training, uh, believe it or not. What's that? Yeah, that's right. They had to sweep them out. They had to maintain them. Here's the other interesting thing. You know, people often think that covered bridges were built to, you know, protect us from the elements so the snow wouldn't get in there and stuff like that. Well, in actuality, most towns in the winter hired people to snow the covered bridges, shovel snow inside the covered bridges. Because remember, you got horse-drawn sleighs that have to get from one place to another. A sleigh does not go well on a wooden deck, so you needed that icy covering inside the the covered bridges. So uh, it's kind of counterintuitive to us today, but uh, in the old days, it was uh, the town snow roller that would often go through the covered bridge to pack it down and uh, provide that. So again, an old form of transportation that, you know, we think it's so hard to get around today in the snow today. You know, think, think in the days before automobile travel. Uh, and a, again, in a covered bridge, you literally had to pay people to put snow in the bridge, so. And also, in some cases, we don't know this. We no, do know that at least in one town, Woodsville, New Hampshire, one bridge collapsed because it had too much snow on the roof. And so we suspect, but we don't know that just like today, some towns probably had to pay people to shovel snow off the roof of some of their bridges. So uh, what a pain that is, huh? Uh, any other questions over here? Yes, sir. The roofs were made primarily to protect the trusses, and you found it made it sound like it 
primarily Northeast Ohio type Pennsylvania maybe. Uh, did they do this in the South? Yeah, covered bridges were built uh, in, a, I don't want to say every state, but many states, probably over 30, 35 states. Uh, if you look at the Southwest places like New Mexico and stuff, they weren't building covered bridges there. But yes, there were, there were covered bridges that we know of in Georgia, uh, Alabama. Uh, many of those were burned by Union armies traveling through and vice versa. Kentucky had a large number of covered bridges. So they were not native to New England. Anywhere uh, a, you know, a, a stream or a river needed fording, you know, from the at early 1805, say, time period into the early 1900s, oftentimes in rural areas, those covered bridges were the solution for that. Uh, the state with the l most remaining covered bridges is Pennsylvania today. Uh, more, uh, Oregon actually has something like 96. They have more than New Hampshire does. Those are much later covered bridges. Many of those were built in the early 1900s as the, uh, that state was developed in the, especially with the logging industry out there. So there are, and of course Vermont has more covered bridges than New Hampshire does. So there are more, there are many, uh, several states that have more covered bridges than we do. None of them have such a wide variety of truss types that kind of reflect the, uh, you know, the architectural heritage and kind of the, uh, you know, how that technology evolved. So it's quite interesting. Well, uh, we will certainly stick around for a few minutes afterwards if anybody wants to look at a book or have, has a question. But thank you all for coming tonight very much. I thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Can I turn this on? Well, I can't get it on. <laughs> but anyway, we want to thank you very much you're for welcome. attending and, and giving us this really interesting presentation. I wanted to recognize our program chairperson, Sally Woodman, who's in the back. She's the person who... <laughs> and she arranges all of our programs, and I think she does a great job. Our next program is scheduled for June 6th, and that should be interesting. It's entitled Montgomery Ward and Sears Roebuck, the 100-Year War. So I hope that you'll attend in June also. Uh, if you remember to bring your surveys up when you leave and put them on the box, that would be great. And thank you all for attending. Yeah. And we thank the New Hampshire oh, Humanities you. Council for making this possible. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to tell everybody, too, your, your other two programs, I know both of those prevent, presenters, uh, Montgomery Ward, Calvin Knickerbocker, you will have a good time with him. He's a really good, and Jay Dennis Robinson, he's talking about treasures from the Isles of Shoals. He's a really good historian. You will, I hope you hit both those programs. They're well worthy of your attention. So thank you very much. <laughs>